Welcome to Hot Topics in the Israel and Jewish World, in which we discuss hot topics in the Israel and Jewish world. Join us now. Hi, these are your hosts. I'm Akiva. I'm Vega. Let's get into today's discussion. Vega, I heard you came home really, really late the night before last. <laughs> yeah, I did a tour. Oh, a tour. Where were you touring? I was touring Kifal Haris. Where, what is Kifal Haris? Kifal Haris, known in Tanakh as Tinat Haris, is a, today in our town, uh, mostly a town where a lot of uh, students live that actually go and learn in Ariel University. Uh, also happens to be a town where there's some Arabs who are not so friendly and nice to Jews and terrorists have come from. But in this town, which is the border of uh, Shevet Ephraim in Israel, are buried Yoshua ben Nun, Khaled ben Yefuna, and Nun, Yehoshua's father. And so last... So those are, those are biblical prophets, references to people that uh, were servants of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. Yes, the, literally Yoshua, as we learn, Joshua came out of Egypt as a child. He was around 42 years old when he came out of Egypt. And uh, he was 82 years old when he brought the Jews into Israel. Um, we have this concept in Judaism of uh, Hilula. As we all know, we celebrate, we do big parties when, when it's a yard type, when it's so, someone's... So you say the, uh, yeah, the, the anniversary of their life. Uh, their anniversary <laughs> of their death. You know, there's a song that, that's been going like viral on like TikTok or Instagram now called... Uh, uh, and there's a line in there, party on the day that I die. It's a very like Jewish concept because like you, you think of that and you sh right away think of like Rashbi and Lag Um So for those who aren't aware, in Israel, there is a ton of holy sites. And while many people are familiar with the main ones, the Western Wall in Judaism or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for Christianity and sites in Bethlehem for Christianity and the mosque, uh, on the Temple Mount, obviously for Muslims, and the Baha'i Center in Haifa, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other churches and, and so forth, right, on, in the there's north. There's so many holy sites for so many yeah, different religions right. here. They're, they're all over. But there's also an equally large number of holy sites around Judaism. The uh, leaders of the biblical tribes are buried at different locations in Israel. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, you know, obviously very famous ra rabbis or rabbinical leaders or Jewish leaders of various times are buried in different places in Israel. Uh, biblical prophets are buried yeah. at different places in Israel. So in this particular case, we're talking about one that's one of the less visited sites, that of Joshua, Yoshua, bin Nun, the son of Nun, who was the student of Moses, and who took over for Moses after Moses uh, Died, left us. Yes. yes, and brought the Jews into Israel. Um, I personally arrange tours and uh, groups uh, and try to run like information through WhatsApp groups, etc., about off of the impact holy sites, holy sites that the regular Jewish religious community is not so familiar with. Uh, or even the regular Orthodox Jewish community, um, because it's very nice that everyone knows about like the Temple Mount and the Western Wall and Marat Machpelah, the Cave of the Patriarchs, and the Tomb of Rachel, Kever Rachel. But I think it's really important not to forget about uh, our other sites and bring awareness to, sadly, the destruction that's happening to these sites by the Arabs, that some of these places were given away in quote-unquote peace treaties that we made with the Arabs, like the Oslo Accords. And um, I, when the opportunity arises, I like to try and take groups, either big groups. A big group for me is like 50 people, 54, and small groups of like 20 or even smaller to take them, learn. And so slowly, like, the word goes out and leeches out and people right. learn more about these people and places and get to experience these very special and unique uh, Jewish experiences of the Hilula or going to pray there and so many, living Tanakh. So many of these sites are located uh, 
in the West Bank, in the Shamron or, and Yehuda. Uh, some of them are located in areas of Jerusalem that are considered East Jerusalem. Uh, in a few cases, they're located across borders, right? So there's, there's sites in Jordan or Egypt that are rarely visited because, yes. because of the security concerns of going to such sites. So in this case, we're talking about uh, the site of Joshua, the student of Moshe, who led Israel. And in particular, this one is located in the West Bank, uh, re relatively close to the West Bank, the Jewish West Bank city of Ariel, and, which you mentioned has a major university that your sister's learning at, interestingly. <laughs> uh, and across the main road to the region from Ariel is this Arab village of Kifal Haret, which uh, at well, you have to tell more in the back of the village. Where is the, where are these tombs? So really, we have the name Kifal Haret. Um, it, we get the name all the way back, not only from the Bible, from from Tanakh, but we get it from um, the Romans. Timna is like the region. And Haris is the name of the town. So today it's called Kifal Haris by the Arabs. There's a nice big like white sign, you know, the ones that we have here in Israel that like point you to like the city yeah. on the highway. Um, and it's about a 10 to 15 minute walk into the town. Now they're not all buried in the same location. They're each buried at different locations. So you say that you say it's a walk into the town, meaning the you, bus, your your tour buses are not driving no, into the so town. No, so so when these events happen, when these I'm going to call them entries if yep. you will. When these entries happen, they are approved by ID, by the IDF and high Israeli security and are uh, coordinated with the IDF and, and other organizations like the Kevri Yosef administration. And the IDF brings a lot of security and puts either the town under curfew or you have to come in bulletproof buses. Um, and we should mention, uh, again, this is the security situation. 30 or 40 years ago, and I visited some of these places 30 years ago, you would drive in and they the, the Arabs provided services around these sites because it was a tourist site and they could run stores and sell trinkets and so forth. And you could park nearby and visit. Nowadays, this is, this is no longer a safe situation. So the Israeli army actually creates a security cordon around the site and then allows people, you know, escorts people in and escorts people out. A hundred percent. I will note, though, that according to the Oslo Accords, the Jews do have rights to be able to go to these sites, and some of these sites should be open 24-7. And literally, there have been... But, but this but this particular site... This is, particular is a, site is it, one of those... It's opened how many times? How often? If, if you're lucky, it's open like five, four or five times a year, if you're lucky. So four or five times a year, it's open in the evening by... High high security bus escorted by the army. Yeah, I mean, even though even though the peace treaties say that this is accessible all the time, c compared to like a lot of the other holy sites that I go to, besides like Jericho, Yericho, um, this one is I, I would call it medium security level. Okay, I mean you don't necessarily have to come by bulletproof bus, but people that don't feel comfortable driving in the Shamron. Uh, would prefer to come it, with a bulletproof bus and an armed uh, driver like I did. Um, and, and it also requires a bit less of IDF security. The IDF is able to open this site to the public, to, to Jews, between two to four and a half hours. The, the average amount of time it's usually open is two and a half to three and a half hours, maximum, maximum four. Um, this is this trip that I did this week was the biggest entry of the year to this particular site. Because it's the anniversary yeah, of his life. because it's the, the anniversary of, of Joshua's death. So uh, tell us about the experience. What's, what, is, what are these, this particular what's tomb, what's it like, and what kind of people come to it? What type of people go there? Um, all types of Jews, really. Religious, non-religious, Hasidic. Even they bring like little kids classes, like uh, different schools that are learning the book of Joshua. Uh, oh, that must be really special. Oh, it's amazing. I, I, that, that actually sounds amazing to be in school, you know, Bible class, so to speak, and you learn about Joshua, you're learning the Parsha, and 
the teacher's like, and next week we're going there. Yeah, so, like, they, they bring, like, kids that, like, you know, these, like, six, seven, eight-year-olds, and, and sometimes even older classes. Um, I can tell you that my specific tour group that I brought was a mix of Hasidic people, non-Hasidic men, women, children. All um, ages? All ages, literally, from newborns to, you know, 90-year-old rabbis show right. up. Right, but it's not the Kotel. It's not exactly... Uh, set up for disabled people and there's not exactly so services actually, there. Actually, I no, they what the Kyrgyz administration arranges a van to take up disabled people because it's a it's a 15 minute walk. There are people who are not capable of making that walk and especially because it's three tombs scattered throughout the city. They're not it's not one specific tomb. Um, so the three tombs are Kalev ben Yefuna, okay. Yoshua ben Nun, and Nun Yoshua's father. So which one? Which one first, so to speak? So uh, the first one you hit, so to speak, on, on yep. the walk is the tomb of Kalev ben Yefuna. Um, it was physically. What's it like? How large is it? Um, it looks. I mean, it's like a little hut. It's I mean, a bit it, bigger than a little hut. So like um, maybe the original, the size of the original Kever Rachel. Yeah, like like you like you see those pictures of the old cave of before like the, the before they turned it into a compound and now they turn it into a security compound. Yeah, so it, it looks kind of like that, and then there's like a side room that's used as like the woman section. Okay. Um, it was so packed that I did not even try to get into like the little room that's like a woman section. Now, when you come so to this so site, so not a lot of phys- it's not like there's multiple doorways. A lot of no, people can't get in at the same time. It's right. The tomb is also right next to what the Arabs use there as their cemetery, as a town cemetery. So there's a very like small narrow path, and there isn't much space in the in the tomb for the men. And the room that holds the woman, like the minute you stick in there, like five women, it's already like too many. Okay. And on a and a time like this, like. 25, 30, 40 are trying to shove themselves in. And it was just... too squeezy. It was... It, it's what, very squeezy. What's the condition of the building? Is it run down? The condition is, is run up? down. The Arabs often spray graf- graffiti there. They have, like, their animals urinate on the... Uh, on the tomb. So they're they, intentionally trying to desecrate it. Yes, intentionally trying to desecrate it. Um, it. It's not in good shape. Every time that basically Jews come to the place, they're like painting and, and doing So they're cleaning it up, up and refreshing yeah, it as, you're best, doing you, as best you can. Uh, yeah. So um, what I so, did... So, so what do people do when they go there? Are they saying to heal him? Are they davening? Are they singing? Are they they're, dancing? <laughs> all those things. All those things. The whole concept of going to pray at the grave of a tzaddik, of a holy person, comes from Kalev ben Yifuna, as we learn in in, uh, in Sefer Bamid Bar Parsha Shlach, um, that the spies were sent to spy on the land of Israel. Moshe sent the spies. Two of them were Kalev ben Yifuna and Yoshua ben Nun. And Yoshua and Kalev ben Yifuna stops by Hebron. I'm sure everyone is very familiar. Mo- most religious people will be familiar with the Avram Fried song, Ki le Kalev natati et Hebron, because I gave to Kalev the city of Hebron because he had a different spirit within him. He went to pray at the grave sites of the patriarchs. And so even today, we know the city of Hebron as the city of Kalev ben Yifuna. And it's, it's a Judean city. It's where King David started his uh, kingdom. Okay, so that's the first, the first two. What's the second one? The second one is, it's another like five minute walk, if not a bit more, depends on the pace of your walk, is the tomb of uh, Yoshua ben Nun. And there's a giant tree that's like, almost like growing out of the, of the caver. Um, the building is a bit bigger than like a small hut. I would call it like, you know, like the size of a, small Israeli living room. Okay. So it's like that. There is no like tombstone in there. It's just like a wall in the back. And so they tell the woman to use like the back side of the building as a woman section and the men use the rest of the area to hang around. Um, again, there's singing, there's dancing, there's free drinks and free food and people giving you out to Helen's or different prayer books to say. Now, and- where, now where is this? Re- I mean, this one's not next to a cemetery, so where's this building? Just by the side of the road? Um, like, I would kind of call it, like, the middle of, like, the shopping center. Because that's what, like, the part... It's like the car in the middle of town. Oh, so this this village has a has a 
sh- shopping district and in the middle of the shopping it's district like, it's like train. right next to the mosque literally like you arrive to the mosque and you continue straight and then you hit um, there didn't used to be a traffic circle there in the last like two years the arabs built like a traffic circle okay. in the town i'm assuming for their own traffic and uh and so like literally you come straight from the mosque and it's right in front of you and there's like it looks like a shopping district. There's like a store there, a sign in Arabic. I don't yeah. know what it. What's means. the con- What's the condition of the build of this building? Um, the condition is a bit better. I mean, most recently, the last time Jews were there, uh, a few months ago, um, which was uh, Arab Asarab Tevet, when it was open mm-hmm. for for the public for Jews, uh, the, the building was covered in Arabic graffiti and desecrated. And so now the the Kev Yosef administration came in and had to do some repairs and paint over the the graffiti. So the, the Kev Yosef administration, by the way, is a volunteer holy site ad, a repair and protection administration for certain holy sites in the Shomron in the yes, West Bank. Yes, yes. And uh, so, I mean, there isn't like a woman's section for women to be able to go inside the tomb, but they get the back wall, which is the back wall is inside the tomb, inside the building, it says Yoshua bin on, on that. And they hang like a beautiful parochet, like a beautiful velvet thing that says, um, he who, who answered Yoshua in Gilgal should an- will, an- will answer our prayers. Um, because uh, we prayed to, um, Yoshua prayed to God to, it's where Am Yisrael camped after crossing the Jordan River into Eretz Israel, and it has some other beautiful psukim. Now, obviously, when the event is over, they have to take this down because otherwise the locals would destroy it. Yeah, no, no Jewish remnant can be left. Anything like no holy books, no nothing, no Jewish symbolism, nothing. It will be burned. It will be destroyed. It will be ripped up and then posted all over terrorist social media. Look how look at the proud, wonderful thing that we did. Now, obviously. Uh, Arab Israelis and, and Arab uh, Jerusalemites come through the Kotel and Jewish areas all the time, and they don't have any concern of being attacked, and they don't have any concern of their mosques being burnt or attacked. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, and the third tomb the is... The third tomb is the tomb of Nun Yoshua's father. It's more in a residential area. Like there's a lot of like apartment buildings and houses around there, and so it's not accessible to the public even during other entries during the year. It's only open during this one entry, and uh, the the IDF usually cornered it off. So like if you're a woman, you have to go through the men's section, which can be a bit like uncomfortable, and you have to like push your way through because like the men are dancing and praying, and like there's groups of let's say ten or fifty like people that came together as a group to, to pray and, and and do different types of things. Um, well, it's certainly awesome that these sites are occasionally available. Oh, 100%. It's all, and, and a, a lot of credit to the IDF, the Israeli army, and the Israeli government that makes a point because they are devoting time and resources and there is risk to 100%. the security forces that are making this available. On the converse side, as you noted, per the Oslo Accords, per all of our peace agreements, these sites are supposed to be available, all holy sites are supposed to be available to all people 24-7. So we see how well that's kept. So to wrap it up, Vega, what is Yoshua Joshua's prayer? At the end of every prayer in the morning that we say, we say the prayer of Aleinu L'Shabeach. May we praise God. And this is the prayer of Yoshua Ben Nun. Wow.